presentation at the same time? Did we? Oh, it's amazing. You guys didn't sleep on it? Is that better? Oh, there's an hour. Oh, there's an hour, Larry. That's right. Hey, thanks for coming tonight, guys. My name's David Russell, and uh, my wife and I spent the last five summers working at Royal Owls on some food in Fairbanks. And Royal Owls are, if you're a burger, anybody burgers out here? Yeah. Burger. Yeah. Yeah. For burgers, Royal Owls are the holy grail of owls. Uh, I, I spend the winter in Ohio, uh, and the Orioles don't even get to the lower 48, other than down the spine of the Rockies. But even there, they're really tough to find. So as a burger, somebody would report to Royal Owl, there's a shock wave that goes through the burger community. For scientists, Royal Owls are an indicator species of oil forest health. We'll talk about oil forest here uh, in a minute, but this is at the top of the food web and is a very important component that relatively, as you'll see, relatively easy to monitor so you can look at the condition of the forest themselves. And finally, for red fence around here, it is the harbinger of spring. After a long winter, you hear the tooting of owls in March and April, and you know spring is around the corner, and you're hoping to see maybe the owl. In some bad winters, you might see them at your feeder, but other than that, you just don't get to see them. But what are you saying tonight? Working with baby owls. And these owlets, this is a, about a 30 day old chick. And we spent, uh, as an indicator species, one of the questions that we'll be asking is how do they change? Well, you can't figure out how they change unless you know what they do to begin with. So Bill and I have spent the last five years with the help of our graduate student, Aaron Anderson, and some other grads spent over the last couple of years. And we spent the last five years trying to figure out how they grow. What do they do? What's their nest? What's it like in the nest? Once a royal owl fledges, once it leaves the nest, they're almost untrackable. Uh, actually, we've uh, we probably followed close to 500 chicks, maybe more, well, probably close to 800 chicks. And we have never found one after it's left the nest. They, uh, they very quickly leave and they bounce off. And as you can see, they're chocolate covered in a dark spruce forest and they're just gone. Now, tonight I want to talk about in a really extreme environment like Mr. Alaska, where we have fluctuating food availability. By that I mean uh, royal owls feed primarily on small rodents. They most Particularly the red-backed vole, which is a uh, endemic species to this boreal forest, the Slamming uh, the Climax boreal forest. So they will eat uh, shrews, uh, small birds. We actually found a haunch of a, a seasonal snowshoe hare in one of the nests. But um, all of these uh, northern mammals basically have cyclical life cycles. So some years we have lots of voles. Uh, next year we have a few less. Next year we have almost none. And Owl populations tend to follow then the fluctuations of their food supply. In this changing environment, then, how is a royal owl that might not necessarily know going into the season there's going to be a lot or a little bit of food, how is it going to maximize its nest success? At the end, I want to spend a few minutes also talking about how might this play out with our changing status conditions. There, uh, there are some pretty significant changes that are happening here in the far north, and how might oils hypothesize a little bit on how much oils might be affected by this. Our observation that, that we started this, this project, uh, Bill and I stepped into a project that was initiated back in the early 2000s uh, by Elasticity Green. And since, in the, in the, over the last 10 years, one of the observations that has come out of the project to date was about between roughly 70% of owls that hatch live to fledging. And so this is kind of the knowledge we had going in, and we wanted to kind of see how this kind of worked out in the real world. Now, this is the Tega forest, also called the boreal forest. Boreal forest is typically inland, Alaska here, white spruce, black spruce, and the muskegs are swampy areas uh, with a mixture of aspen and, and birch and alder. Uh, the 
mature forest is relatively dense, doesn't have an understory once you get inside the tree and drop the moss. Uh, and it's basically, um, and how, how is Professor? So, I'm just going to clap a little bit tonight. Uh, so, bear with me for a second. But what I want you to notice is plant communities around the world are basically where plants are found are dictated by, in large part, certainly soils, but in large part by moisture and by temperature. So if we look at Tega Forest, right here, you'll see that basically we're living in an extremely long, cold winter, relatively dry region. And this is going to, we'll, we'll see how this is going to play out a little bit in the future. Uh, but so we're looking at low temperatures, relatively low rainfall. In addition to that, the boreal forests are present at about the same latitudes all the way around the globe. So they go from Scandinavia, Norway, uh, Sweden, all the way across uh, Europe and Asia, and then across North America, noticing they really don't get down into the lower 48 except along the spine of the Rockies. Interestingly enough, range of boreal owls are circumboreal, so they range across Europe and Asia, and then through the boreal zone in North America, the, uh, there are a number of subspecies that are present in the Old World. We have a single sub, 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 subspecies in, uh, in North America. Also, notice they do come down the spine of the Rockies a little bit here. Am I causing your consternation? No, but I don't think the mics are picking you up at all. That's because I'm quiet. <laughs> I hate to interrupt. Oh, you're going to love me with a microphone. Okay, you can clip this on your belt. Stick this up near your lapel. How's that work? Yeah, sounds Is that better? Good. Yeah. Good All right. Okay, so. The owls are cavity nesters, and uh, the cavities are in natural cavities, but predominantly, at least up here, uh, looks like northern flickers, yellow shafted variety, is uh, the, makes most of the nest cavities that, natural, um, that the owls naturally nest in. These owls are, in the literature, uh, the owls feed uh, between 95 and 98% on red-backed foals. And so they're basically, they are ma small mammal specialists. And as a small mammal specialist, owls have basically been in an arms, rate, arms race evolutionarily with their prey. They eat all the slow ones, the slow ones get faster, and if the owls don't learn to catch fast foals, then they starve. And so this is constant race going on. As such, owls have evolved eyes in the front of the head. This allows for binocular vision, so very, uh, a very useful character for uh, a predator, uh, many things like robins and that, you'll see the eyes are on the side, so they don't have much overlap in the vision in front. In addition to that, the eyes actually have a membrane in the back that as light goes in, it hits the membrane and bounces and comes back out. So the light basically gets two shots at the photocells, so they can, in essence, see under very, very low light conditions. Owls have wonderful needle-sharp claws. Uh, handling owls, they're not so wonderful, but these needle sharp claws are very effective in holding and killing prey. In addition, uh, owls have these feathered tarsi, feathered feet, so uh, certainly in cold winter conditions, you're not going to get it, uh, have as much chance of frostbite. I've cheated here a little bit. This is a northern sawwit owl that we banned in the fall in, uh, in Ohio, but it's a very close relative of the boreal owl. Owls have exquisite hearing. And this hearing, if you take the face disc, which is basically a sound antenna, this face disc here, and if we take and very carefully pull back the feathers along the edge, right in here, that's the ear. And this ear takes up a huge portion of the side of the skull. In addition to that, in many owl groups, 
One ear on the right side is positioned a little bit higher on the skull than on the left side. So even in the almost total absence of light, light gets to one ear just a little bit faster than the other, and they can triangulate on prey even in total darkness. In addition to that, this is the leading edge of the wing on the left side of an owl, on the right side that's a red-tailed hawk. You'll notice the leading edge is fringed in the owls, and it's unfringed in in most of your, well, in, other, in all your other hawks. That fringe dampens airflow that goes over the wing, so they don't whistle when they come in. So a mouse isn't going to be uh, tipped off that he's about to be grabbed. And another really cool thing that's really useful for researchers is owls don't have teeth. Now, it sounds obvious, but when owls eat, they'll take a vole, They'll grab it, and if it's small enough, they just gulp it, one big gulp. It's wonderful, except for the fact, now you've got this whole vole inside you. How do you, how do you chew it? So nearly all birds of prey, uh, and certainly including owls, they basically they have two parts of their stomach. One's a muscular part, one's a chemical part. And that muscular part grinds it all up except for the undigestible portions. That's the large bones, like the skull, maybe a couple of leg bones, and the hair or the feathers, depending on what the prey item happens to be. Before they can eat again, they have to cough up the remnants of their previous meal. We call it an owl pellet. For those of you who have had roosting owls uh, in your yard, sometimes you can look underneath uh, a, a frequent owl roost, and you can see, in the case of boreals, maybe the size of the end of your thumb. Uh, if you've got a great horned owl, uh, the size of a golf ball or a little bit larger, the remnants of the previous night's meals. This is tremendous for researchers because we can go through and collect them and then basically follow kind of a daily cycle of what they're eating uh, by identifying, if you'll notice right here, you can see a rodent skull with the incisors, and that's one of the key characters for uh, identifying some of these rodents. So you can actually go through and tell what the prey items are without having to disturb the owls. Boreal owls, while they're at the top of the kind of the small animal food web, are themselves uh, victims of being predated on. And this actually was a great horned owl that was a picture taken when we stayed on campus our first year. It's out the window. Great horned owls are a, uh, um, a, a very important predator around here. If they can throttle it, they'll eat it. So um, boreal owls, um, other owls, um, anything. Um, and when around home, they're also found, they're actually found all the way to Argentina, but uh, they'll eat skunks. They'll eat uh, snakes, they'll eat large birds, take waterfowl. Uh, so uh, this is a, a major pre uh, predator around here. This is the hoot owl, you know, the hoo, 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 that you might hear in early spring also. Mammalian predators, and I'm sorry, this is a little blurry. Mammalian predators for boreals are probably pine martens, uh, is the predominant one. These are in the weasel family. Uh, they're uh, typically uh, feed on a red squirrel. They will take other mammals, but when, again, when mammal populations are down, they're looking for alternative food uh, sources and uh, boil and boil eggs. In Europe, this is one of the main predator of boil owl nests, uh, particularly at the egg stage, where they'll go in and take the eggs uh, for them. I'm sure this is a, a major predator of fledged owls or owlets uh, once they're out. Uh, these guys are uh, tremendously fast and certainly very good at what they do. Now, this is from a couple of years ago. My wife and I came up here uh, 2010, I think. Um, it was her fault. Uh, I'm up here. And uh, I thought, oh, you know, this, this, it can't be too bad. And I went back. I, I'm teaching, I teach an environmental biology class uh, at Miami. And I thought I'd look up the weather for Fairbanks that day. This is uh, November 17th. It wasn't even Thanksgiving yet. And I had to put this, I, 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 I use this in my lectures at Ohio saying, it could be worse, guys, quit whining. Look at this. So I want you to think about this from an owl perspective. You're a young owl, you hatch uh, at the end of June, usually after 30 days, uh, 25 to 32 days of incubation. You spend about 30 days in the nest. So you're out by the end of June, usually beginning of July. Now you have July, August, September, a little bit of October, 
And during that time, you've got to learn to fly. You've got to grow the rest of your feathers in. You've got to learn to hunt and be an owl. And you've got to avoid predators. And then before Thanksgiving, it's 39 below. This is a tough world up here. In addition to that, and this was Thanksgiving, I think of the same year, uh, where uh, you had an ice storm. Now, boreal owls are plunge feeders. In essence, when you get two feet of snow, they will hear or the voles will come to the surface and then go back in, and the owls will spot them and literally just poof, dive into the snow and grab them. Very problematic when you have a layer of snow and then a half an inch of ice and then snow on top. Uh, diving into the snow doesn't work very well. Matter of fact, you can probably get hurt. So our understanding and from talking with fish and game is they have, and I'll talk about the boxes here in a minute, they have nest boxes spread through this whole area. The nest box occupancy rate was typically between 35 and 45% um, occupancy each year. We started the first year of our study and our occupancy rate was 14%. So the owls didn't do very well that winter. And they haven't really picked up since. Uh, we've been up, uh, we're close to 20% now, but uh, they nowhere near the 35 or 40% that uh, they were seeing a decade ago. So to kind of uh, give you an idea, where, here's where we're at. Nice to know that. Here's Fairbanks. Where we, our study area was basically, we have nest boxes out the steese, and it goes to just about tree line before Eagle Summit. So about 73, 74 miles out the Steese Highway here. Out the Elliott, it goes up and around the curve. So it's about 90 miles out the Elliott. Uh, you can see where the Dalton comes off here and, and heads to uh, Dead Horse. So the area we're working with is here and here. Uh, Jill and I have a graduate student who hopefully will be graduating this year. And last summer, he had nest box cameras in 20 nest boxes. And he did, in the six weeks he was monitoring the owls, he did over 8,000 miles up to Steese and the Elliott tracking owls. Here are the locations of the nest boxes. So you can see they're basically along the Steese, along the Elliott up to about 90 miles. They're also um, some done by Ninana and also on the Parks Highway, but we didn't, we didn't go in that direction. It just it was, the logistics were, were too much. These nest boxes, they were installed initially because as a species of special concern and a potentially sensitive species to climate change, there had to be a way to monitor owl populations. The way you typically monitor owl populations is you do hoot surveys. And a hoot survey is you drive during nesting season or during uh, prior, just prior to nesting, during breeding season as it initiates, you drive every half mile along a road system and you play a tape. If you get a response, the assumption is that there's a pair then in that location. And so then you go another half mile. And so basically your response to the hoot survey gives you a rough estimate of the owl population. Uh, so they were running hoot surveys all the way up to Steese, all the way up the Elliott, down the parks. There were some discrepancies that seemed to be coming out on, on years that had really strong callbacks. They didn't seem to have many nest box occupied. And so uh, they were trying to find another way to basically confirm the numbers that they were finding from hoot surveys. Uh, they decided that the best way to do it is just to put up a series of nest boxes. And as such, there's about 250 to 300 of them that were placed starting in about 2001 along these roads. These nest boxes, and I, uh, I'd love to meet the guy who put them out. Once you get out of town, it all looks the same. So it would only make sense to me to find a nice pull-off along the Elliott, go 20 feet inside from the road, find a nice stable tree, and put the nest box up at about 15 feet. No, you might go on a curve, and they might be up a hill with a tree that's on a slant backwards at about 18 feet. I'm pretty tall, so when you get a 15-foot ladder, now you're reaching into nest boxes with owls that don't want you to reach into nest boxes. Um, you've, got, uh, you've got ladders on hillsides. I, 
uh, no wonder he left. But um, what we're looking at is nest boxes then that are placed and I want to say right up front, one of the biggest concerns from a researcher's perspective is not impacting the organism that you're studying. And working with nests, uh, particularly bird nests, can be very tricky. One of the nice things about boreal owls is in the literature, they've been studying these for a lot of years in Finland because actually it's an endangered, uh, that subspecies is an endangered species uh, down through Spain. And they found that um, Boreals are actually very uh, accommodating to researchers in nest boxes. Uh, and there, you have to be sure that you're not visiting the boxes regularly prior to the chicks hatching. In other words, at the initiation of egg laying, you kind of let them go. Once the first egg hatches, the instinct to feed far outweighs anything else. And so in uh, over five years, we had we're happy to say we had zero nests that were abandoned. And in fact, we went and visited nests every other day uh, and weighed and measured chicks. And it got to the point where um, familiarity breeds contempt. And uh, it got, uh, I didn't put the video in tonight, but there's a video of a female that decided she just didn't like me about halfway through it. And so they come in like little missiles and you can't hear them until you just hit hit in the side of the head. And you're 15 feet up the side of a ladder. And my wife is supposed to be there to say, hey, it's coming, duck. But instead, I would look down, she's filming. And then all you would hear on the film is the giggle, giggle, giggle as I get whapped by this owl as it would come in. We had other females that just chose not to leave the nest box after a while. So you actually had to backhand her gently out of the way, remove the chicks. We'll take them down, do our work, and then put move her out of the way and put the chicks back in, which works out great when you can see in the box. When you can't see in the box, usually you're reaching right into two feet that are doing this and you get torn up. Uh, so um, while it's really nice that uh, it's a great animal to work with, uh, I would have liked, and actually after a while you get them to the point where you toss them out and they'll sit on a branch that's maybe eight, 10 feet away and just stare at you the entire time. Uh, and you're never really quite sure if they're going to come in and hit you or if they're just going to stare at you. But they, uh, they, were, they were great to work with. Here's one of the nest boxes. Uh, you might also notice the, uh, um, I weigh an eighth of a ton, and the ladder's not quite rated for that. So uh, getting me on the top of a ladder in a swaying tree was also a very interesting experience. Here's what it looks like in the nest box. So here's a female boreal. Male boreal owls uh, do not... Male boreal owls don't have anything to do with the incubation. They simply provision. So what a male boreal owl will do is he'll bring in, um, here's our voles. He'll bring them in, hands them off to the female. She stacks them up like cordwood in front of her. So remember, she's been incubating for about 30 days. And so depending on vole populations, we had nest boxes that had 25, 30 voles stacked up like cordwood. She's also um, very OCD about them. Uh, we would frequently take the voles out weigh them to see what prey mass was, to see how, what varieties or species were in, present in there. And then I was less than ceremonious about putting them back in. I just kind of lumped them back in the corner. And we'd come back a day and a half later, and they'd all be nice and neatly lined up again. Um, some of them don't have heads. These are the ones typically the male ate the, the front half and then delivered the back half on the way in. Here's what it's like without a few. Actually, you'll notice it's a different nest. Now. A couple of things about this. One, you'll notice here's where she typically sits. We've got an egg. We've got a very small youngster. We've got a little bit bigger youngster. We've got a bigger yet and a bigger yet youngster. They're asynchronous breeders, meaning that uh, if you have robins, for instance, the robins in your yard, she'll lay four eggs. She comes in one day, lays an egg in the nest, leaves the nest, kind of messes around a little bit. Second day comes in, Broods for a little bit, lays a second egg, leaves. Third day comes back, lays another egg. Fourth day comes back, lays another egg. Now she's got her full set, and she incubates. Consequently, the eggs all hatch within a couple of hours of each other. So all baby robins in the nest are the same age, and they're pretty much out of the nest uh, within a couple of hours. These guys are laying eggs in April, and many times it's still 10, 15 below zero in April. So she'll lay an egg, and there's no place she can go. So she'll lay an egg, 
She'll sit. About two days later, she'll lay another egg and sit. Two days later, another egg. Um, the clutch is between typically four and six eggs. And, but what it also means is the first egg that was laid is going to hatch. And then two days later, another one will hatch. Two days later, another one. So if you have six, in, six eggs in there, it might be 12 days, almost two weeks, between the hatching of the first individual and the hatching of the last individual. This adds some very interesting dynamics based on hatch order into the nest box, hence the Al la carte title tonight. When we get here, what we'll do is uh, we go up very quickly, take the chicks down. We used a fishing creel, and um, Jill is, she, <laughs> she doesn't like heights. So I was very proud of her. She did go up on the ladder a couple of times. But she happily sits down here in the cloud of mosquitoes, and we bring the owlets down. You actually, you can see one here, and there's one there, there's one there. And on the ground, it's like a visit to the doctor's office. Here, we go through, we take Coleman measurements, we take skull measurements, we take um, tarsal measurements, and we'll also um, uh, take tarsus and foot and wing and tail and eye color and all of the components, and we do this every other day for the chicks. And we finally, we weigh them, and we also, when possible, we capture the female and we put a band on her. And one of the interesting things, um, I'm a bird bander, and uh, aging is a really important part of bird banding so we can get an idea of the distribution of age classes within a population. It's also very important for boreal owls in that they can breed their first spring. So these are second year birds. They can breed depending on winter conditions, their condition, and so looking at the age of the females is really important to see kind of how, um, how the age distribution or the breeding is going. And the way we do this is really kind of cool. If you look closely, you can see the wings here are very dull, worn brown. These wing feather, these primaries are much richer brown. And in this individual, all the wing feathers are the same color. These feathers here have been replaced, these have not. And there's a standard molting pattern for these birds, so we can tell up to about four years how old the bird was based on their molt pattern of the wings. So we could tell, uh, for instance, that first year when we only, when we, uh, we only had 16% occupancy rate, there wasn't a single second year female her first spring. Uh, they were all older females. Um, the next year, we had just a couple of uh, second year birds. Uh, but this, the last time we did it, we had about half and half. So things, things were certainly changing as the winter conditions were changing a little bit there. In addition to that, Jill had some students, and she's at Mount St. Joe University in, Ohio, in Cincinnati. Uh, she had some students and, that we uh, took DNA samples. And this is like CSI. We took a buckle swab and to get the epithelial cells from the uh, mouth. And these we then sequenced uh, using sex chromosome primers. So we basically, in, in humans, males are XY, females are XX. So males are the heterogrammatic sex. We have the two different kinds of chromosomes. Birds are exactly opposite. So birds, males have a ZZ, and females have a WZ. What that really means is the ZZ chromosome in males, both of them are identical. In females, the W has a longer non-coding region in that chromosome. So when we put our primers on either side to make copies of what's in between, in the W, it's a longer piece that comes out of that. So what we can tell then, as so we run it out, if there's two bands, it's a female. If there's one band, it's a male. And in this way, it's going to be really important when we look at very young chicks, as we're looking at survivorship of very young chicks before uh, we could, uh, there's any weight differences. Uh, the DNA would allow us to tell what the sex was, uh, even if they didn't make it to, uh, to fledging. So here's an 11.1 gram egg. After 25 to 30 days, it hatches. But this is a naked chicken. 
Think about this. You are a female owl. You've got a down jacket on, and you're going to brood eggs or young. If you sit on them with a down jacket, you're not getting any heat transfer. So just before, and this occurs in nearly all birds, just before they lay their eggs, they hormonally lose their feathers on their breast and belly. It's called a brood patch. Now the feathers on the edge are able to kind of stretch over it so that she doesn't have this giant bear patch when she's out and about. But this uh, took a, kind of went and blew as Jill took a picture. And you can see the brood patch looks like a naked chicken. And so when we saw that nest box that had the chicks along the edge with the egg, the egg tends to be under, and it's almost too hot for a lot of the chicks, so they moved the outside rim of the brood patch here. But this is how you can tell nesting females. Now, when that 11 gram egg, when the chick's about to hatch, think about it from a chick's perspective. How does it get out? And what these birds have, just like chickens and others, they have an egg tooth. This egg tooth is on the end of the bill, and they go tap, 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 tap on the inside, and it basically chips out a hole that allows them to crack and come out of the egg. This egg tooth falls off after about 14 days, so you're not going to see it on any of the adult bills. So this is the same individual that we're going to follow over the course of its time in the nest. We do this in about six-day increments. So remember the egg was 11.1 .1 grams. On day one, Youngster hatches is 9.8 grams. On day six, notice it can hold its head up a little bit, but the eyes are still closed, and it's now about 40 grams. On day 12, the eyes are just starting to open. We'll see it's now starting to get feathers along the feather tracks. Uh, notice also the rich red color. Some of these nest boxes are in the sun, and they get pretty hot. So um, the, the chicks actually would be panting. The other interesting thing is, and I didn't put pictures of it in, is the feet at this point, notice that they're very soft. They're not scaly yet, like you'd expect of a, a chicken leg or something. The sear, which is right up here, and the soft legs are prime targets for mosquitoes. So the vast majority of these chicks that we followed had these really puffed up eyelids and puffed up legs as mosquitoes fed on them over the course of the time until they got enough feathers to hide them under or until the legs hardened up. So here's day 18. And now notice uh, in the initial picture of the boreal, you saw how bright yellow the eyes were. Well, they start out kind of as this pasty kind of white, and they slowly yellow over time. So now at day 18, we've got our feather track is... Now starting to expand, we're starting to get our face disc in, and notice that the, even at day 12 on this one, the egg tooth is gone. Now, this is a very difficult time for researchers. These guys eat dead voles. Some of these dead voles have been sitting in the box for a week. And so they're gulping this kind of rancid flesh, they're processing it, and this is a distended abdomen of a well-fed owlet. It's basically like picking up a water balloon that nobody's tied the end. And after a day, you're absolutely covered with the foulest smelling concoction you could ever imagine. It usually took Jill and I about nine, maybe 10 hours to do the run. Uh, I, I teach, Jill and I both teach here in the morning and we'd make it into the field about one, and it'd take us till about 10 at night to get our run every other day uh, done for these. Well, at 10 o'clock, the only place that's open in town is Pizza Hut. And it only took about a week, and we had our own section. <laughs> they'd walk in, they knew what we wanted, they had us sequestered, and everybody was happy. But, oh, this is uh, it's a horrible stage. At day 24, Notice, now we're getting to be that chocolate brown color. The eyes are much yellower. And by day 28, day 28, they can begin to leave the nest a little bit. But um, most of them hung out until about day 30, day 31. We could tell when they were about to leave. And notice that this individual um, started at 9.8 grams. After 24 days, it was 158 grams. So it's 
it's dramatically increased its body size. It was 100 and, almost 170 grams after four weeks. And there reaches a stage. Now, these guys have seen us every other day of their life. They are the most docile, cute individuals until they become teenagers. Just we know when we're not going to see them anymore when they get attitude. So at this point, they're all, they're nice. We'd actually take students out that would help us and everybody loved them. Then we get to this stage and it's back off. This is my scale. I don't want you to mess with me. And I start having to tape my fingers because they get hundreds of little punctures um, as they foot me. Uh, they're, they're just, and there, there's some threshold of mental development, or, and they just become little predators. And we know at that point, we won't see them again. They'll be, they'll be gone from the nest by the time we get back. Here's the other cool thing about boreal owls. Remember, they're asynchronous hatchers. Boreal owls have one of the highest, or the highest, um, reverse sexual dimorphism of any bird, meaning that females are larger than males. And females are not only larger than males, they can be up to 50% larger than males. So a female boreal owl runs roughly 200 grams, uh, about the size of a heavy pigeon, a little bit larger. Male boreal owls can be 135, 127, 140 grams tops. So females are considerably larger than males, and this, in fact, is the old chick in the nest box. This is a female that is third in line. So she's at least four days, if not six days, younger than he is. And yet she's already towering over him. And again, when we start talking about the dynamics in a nest box, we have a fluctuating prey population. These these chicks, we have fluctuating prey populations. We have chicks that are very young, two days older, two days older, two days older, and two days older. At this time, when the male brings the food in, who gets the food? Well, nobody can see yet, so they're, they're very dependent upon the female to feed, and she can basically feed everybody in turn. But now look, this is the same nest and the littlest one still can't lift its head up. The oldest ones, they can see what's going on. They're big. They're heavy. Now, who do you think gets the food when it comes in? This is that, uh, it, it's thought to be an evolutionary uh, advantage then for birds that don't necessarily know what the given food's crop going to be so that you lay the same number of eggs every year. If you have good vole populations, everybody, or nearly everybody, lives. If you have bad populations, it just depends on how bad as to how many of them don't make it. And I call it delayed provisioning, because we get to about day 16, and the older ones start eating the younger ones. One of the uh, best grant proposals we never got is when we started this, we, had, we were very optimistic. We thought, this is, these are the cutest little owls. Wouldn't people love to see these in the schools around here, in the office of Fish and Game? So we were trying to figure out ways of getting nest box cams, live cams, put in so that we could have the feeds going to the local schools and we could talk to them and include them in this project. I could only imagine the mental scarring we would have created once everybody had named the owlets and they started getting eaten one at a time by their siblings. So here's what I'm talking about, though, from that they start, everybody's about the same. Here's day one. Here's day 31. This is looking at over 200 chicks. As we go through time, we get to about day 17, day 16. And look at the split. Females suddenly just blow up in size. She winds up over the 160 gram range. Males plateau out, and they wind up at about 120 grams. 
One of the most difficult things as researchers and as mentors of students is for 16 days, we've been working with every one of these chicks every other day. We know them all. We put food coloring under their wings so we can tell, um, we can tell who's whom when we get there. Oh, that's green right or that's blue left. So we know the chicks even when they start looking pretty similar as, as they age. Well, you get to an nest box and one's missing. Who is it? You get to the nest box and there's a leg in it. You get to a nest box, there's just a skull in it. And it's really difficult for young researchers as your friends now are getting eaten by the others and then you're not sure who to be mad at. Or, but, you know, that's science. You know, we're, we're here to record. And the other thing is, is when you, in low prey years, we would see birds get to about 140 grams. And the next time they're 130 grams, next time they're 120 grams. And we saw them slowly waste away. And, you know, as you know, the, the human part of you wants to say, oh, let's all take them in and take care of them. But as researchers, you have to just observe and see what's going on. So it, it's very, uh, it's, there's a lot of life lessons in this. So what I want to show you here is some uh, video cam that uh, Aaron, our grad student, uh, put together from one of the nest boxes. We have so much more to learn. We, we have a pretty good handle on growth and development, but we have, uh, I think, four terabytes of video of sibling interactions that we were just looking at provisioning rates currently, but there's all sorts of other interactions that we can look at um, down the road. But what... I, but, Females typically will leave the nest only for about 45 minutes a day. And she would probably go out, defecate, uh, maybe feed. Uh, males uh, will cache voles. And so she might go out, get a vole, eat, uh, probably bathe, and then she's back in the nest box. What we're going to see here is a male coming into provision when the female is gone from the nest box. Right in the beginning of the video, you're going to see the female strafe them. Just real quick, she'll blow by. And then, watch what happens as he goes in, and he begins to do that paternal thing of feeding chicks. So this is the male. Look how small he is. Boom, there she goes. So here's inside the box. Notice we have a bird in here also. Uh-oh. You hear something. You see bird prey here. Now he's looking out. Oh no, mom arrives. And she bodily throws him out. And life goes on. We have so much more to learn. We have no idea where this is going. I want you to notice at the bottom of the box there, there's a bird. Over the last couple of years, our typical prey items, redback voles, sorex shrews, uh, there's about five species around here, there's probably masked shrew. And in some areas that have road cuts where we have grassy margins, they'll get meadow voles that come up. But again, voles are the predominant food source and in the literature, over 95% of the food source. What we saw was 71 to 73% of the chicks survived at any given nest box over the last 10 years. However, we began to see birds appearing in nest boxes. Aaron had some nest boxes that had over 35% birds that were in them. The question becomes why and what are the implications of this? Also, we have over 70% fledgling success rate. Here's what we found. On the steese, in the disturbed fire area, as you go up from the fire from a couple years ago, we had 46% survivorship rate. On the Elliott, in the undisturbed regions, we had 
90% survivorship. The average is about 70%. So as we begin to look at this into the future, we've got our bulls and our shrews, but now we're beginning to get lots of birds in the boxes. Now a specialist mammal feeder is becoming a generalist. It's now feeding on what's available, whether it be juncos or hermit thrushes or Swainson's thrushes or uh, ruby crowned kinglets or yellow rumped warblers. And another very interesting thing we found is we would go up and we would physically take the chicks out of the nest, crawl down the ladder, and do all our measurements. We had females that would come back to the nest box while we were right there with the chicks, and the chicks were making all the little cheeping noises, and they would not go after us. They would go into the nest box and grab some of the provisioned food and take it away, as if we were going to take the food. Don't care about the chicks. Don't take our food. And then when we put the chicks back up in the nest box, she'd come back with the food and put the food back in. The disturbance is largely fire. The boreal forest is typically a, um, it's a, a regime that's maintained by fires uh, up to about every 200 years. And then you get successional growth that comes in after that. This is the fire up that was up on the Steese. Now we're back to class. When we look at boreal owls, for instance, Boreal owls are going to live in a particular environment based on its moisture and its temperature. We're going to have specific plants that are going to be associated with that environment. We're going to have a specific set of mammals, of birds, of insects that are also associated with that particular environment. And in the absence of competition, you might be able to live in a relatively broad or expanded area. However, with competition, you do best in an area here, you're able to outcompete others that might eat, uh, might eat voles or might eat um, other small mammals. In an area, you do best, and they'll have their own realized niche. Now, let's look at Ortega Forest here. The reason for the concern is with climate change, we're getting warmer and warmer and warmer. With that warm, with the temperature increase comes increased dryness, which increases fires. But notice what happens if I'm getting warmer and I'm getting drier. I'm no longer coming back as Tega Forest. I'm potentially coming back as shrub or grassland. And when we look at where do boreal owls, where are boreal owls going to be in the next 25, 50 years? We're now competing against, potentially, that little sawwet owl that we had. We looked at its ear. I believe last year was the first year you had sawwets here in, uh, in Fairbanks. I was watching the hotline, and they're all excited. There is a sawwet owl up. We do get them down by Anchorage. Well, now we're getting sawwet owls up here. That's northern hawk owl. We, uh, we got pictures of those up along the fire, the burn areas uh, along the Dalton. Well, they also will actually take boreals. And so now we're beginning to move other competitors in that might be better suited for open burned regions rather than these closed canopy forests that boreals are doing so well in. In addition to that, look at this. BBC, 10 years ago, BBC published this map on what they expect in North America. Notice 10 years ago, the wheat growing region in the U.S. is here. Here's what they expect by 2050. Look at... Fairbanks, the expectation, we're going to be a giant grassland. We're going to be wheat like Montana. So when we look at boreal species, and here's a map of the boreal forest in North America, look where our grasslands potentially are, or climates that are appropriate for glass, grasslands. This is why my concern for boreal owls. Right now, there's no issues with boreal owls. They're very common across their whole range. But as we begin to look at changes that are occurring in the climate, there are going to be shifts, there's going to be uh, additional competitors, and there's going to be additional challenges which might not work out so well for boreal owls, being a specialist species here. 
we didn't do this work in a vacuum. Uh, certainly Jill, my wife, and Aaron, a grad student, and our undergrads. Uh, Travis Booms, uh, Alaska Fish and Game, the non-game biologist, is fabulous. Uh, our institutions, uh, we had a number of trusts and others that helped us support the, uh, the effort. It cost a lot of money to run trucks around up here. And I want to thank you for coming tonight. And certainly if you have any questions, I think I have a couple minutes left if, uh, uh, if you have any questions. Yes. Yep, with the, with uh, Denver. Well, Denver comes up from uh, uh, from Montana. Oh. Yeah, so he only, he only comes up in the winter oh, on that. Cool. Yeah, well, Denver is kind of the yeah, but yes, um, snowy owls are actually another. Uh, it's a very interesting species, and Denver's been studying them for 30, 35 years and looking at population fluctuations. Uh, the the boy. Um, uh, the snowy owls um, are very dependent upon lemming populations. So with the fluctuation in lemming populations, and one of the other interesting things about uh, climate change that appears to be happening, we don't have a lot of evidence in North America, but it's happening in Europe, is those fluctuations in, for instance, snowshoe hares, I believe, are on a seven-year cycle. Uh, voles are on a three-year cycle. And depending on what species of vole, there, so you have all these. So some years you might have a banner year, and everybody's top. Um, some years, everybody's crashed, and you have very poor. Well, what they're seeing in Europe now is those fluctuations are dampening. So as it's warming, as we're going into the northern latitudes, it's, it's dampening off these fluctuations. They tend to be more of a consistent uh, level, and we're not sure what that means to a lot of the populations uh, of predators, uh, other than they might end up being maintained at a more suppressed level and not have the boom and bust cycles. But uh, it, the the snowy owls are starting to show some of that kind of weird shifting, uh, as are short-eared owls. Yes? You were mentioning about 20% of the box is now being occupied. Is it the same box here? That's a great question. Um, it is not the same boxes. And uh, also, we have banded, I don't know, 1,000 chicks in the last five years, maybe a little bit less. Uh, plus uh, nearly 100 or 150 females. And we have never caught one of our fledged chicks in any box in any area. So uh, one of the things we'd love to do is, is do some telemetry work and see just where they're dispersing to. I mean, there's a lot of areas you can't get to that, you know, they can be 500 yards off the road and we would never get to them. But um, we've never gotten any. However, we have caught females that have moved three miles over. And... Uh, we actually had one repeat nest box where one year it was one female, the next year it was another female. So they don't appear to repeat. Um, every year Travis goes through or has his crew go through, and that nest box, they put um, wood chips in the bottom. So uh, the female's laying on wood chips. Now after, well, after almost six weeks of occupancy, that nest box kind of is like a stockyard after a rain. Um, you reach in and it's mushy and it's got decayed vole in it and it's got fecal material and it's got carrion beetles and it's got fleas and it's got maggots and uh, Travis doesn't like bugs so he waits until after the first freeze in October and then he, um, and it's called a brick and so they go in and, and they literally stick a screwdriver into the brick and flip it out so the nest boxes get cleared every year. Um, but I think in natural nest cavities, they probably have to have a year or two or three just because of all the parasites that might be present in them. Uh, but, uh, but yes, <laughs> that, um, <laughs> if you ever want, as a grad student, if you ever want a job, no. there are, um, there's a tremendous amount of work to be done on going through bricks to look at all the bits of bone fragments to see just what the youngsters have fed because it all gets coughed up. And, and so you can spend hours going through bricks. It's, it's great fun. I'm an entomologist also, I, uh, and the bugs are fabulous. Um, Derek Sykes over at the museum, I brought him some fabulous fleas and great beetles. Uh, Derek worked with carrion beetles, and, and so that pile of dead voles will frequently have a beetle or two on top. So all sorts of great stuff that are in there. So there's lots, lots of work to be done here.
Yes. Um, in the uh, in the burned area, and uh, it looks like juncos are particularly taking it. Um, juncos and swains and thrushes, uh, but there is a mix of uh, ruby crown kinglets, um, ruby crown, um, a couple of boreal chickadees, and and, uh, and yellow rump warblers. But uh, juncos are predominantly the uh, the one that's really taking it. So that's more of an open area. Yeah. And are you seeing that as a result of less bowls or more birds? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, Aaron uh, this year also ran some trappings trying to determine vole populations and was horribly unsuccessful. Um, we, we, we didn't get many voles, so we're not really sure if it's, uh, but it's it's been a relatively consistent showing of birds in the burned areas as opposed to fluctuating like we would expect. Um, but in the burned areas, we've also got a different, uh, we have more meadow voles and more shrews and things like that. The other interesting thing is in the literature, shrews are a big part of the diet for, on alternate years when, when the vole populations are down. And we had very few shrews except for a couple of individual boxes where the males seem to be really good at finding shrews. And so we'd have a box that have four or five shrews in it, and then you might go 18, 20 boxes and never see another, or the whole rest of the day and never see another shrew. So shrews didn't appear to, actually birds seem to fill in the, the shrew category uh, more for us than uh, um, others. But uh, there's, a, there's a ton of work to be done in, in looking at that. Question? Well, I'm just curious with the, with the birds, um, I'm assuming that they report all of them on the surface. Can anything distract the birds at night? Well, um, the, that's, that's another good question. The, it's daytime constantly in June, basically. So, um, but even though it's, uh, if one of the things Aaron found in looking through terabytes of uh, box video is that they maintained about the same hunting hours as darkness would be. So male activity and provisioning at the box usually occurred after 1 a.m. and until about 5 a.m. And he actually never had a provisioning event between about eight in the morning and five in the afternoon. So even if the um, uh, even if it was light out, there were the males at least were still maintaining that. Um, at the same time, uh, and that's one of the the interesting things is is now you've got a vole specialist that's trying to catch birds when it's light, and um, I think juncos are just slow. So uh, the other the other thing, there was a box out on the Elliot that uh, we had a hermit thrush that was saying every time we were out at the box, and then one day he wasn't. And there was a hermit thrush skull in the box. So, uh, <laughs> yes. So when you pick up the baby, you know, the little bar there. Yeah. Um, is there a reason that the fact that they may be losing nutrition is true? Oh, that no, there. It's it's out the back end, not the front end. It, it's already been processed. And, and it's a wonderful golden orange color. You, you'll never forget it. Yes? So, are the yellow territorial? And if so, what, or if not, what kind of range are they hunting from around the nest? Are they going very far? Are the males very successful just in a spot, or are they going really far? That's another great question. Um, yeah, the, uh, we have to go back to the literature to look at that. And basically what we did when we, when we determined the disturbed versus undisturbed, we went roughly uh, a kilometer around the nest box. And that was thought to be kind of the home range of these individuals. Now, in Europe, and we, and we haven't been able to find evidence here yet, but in Europe, depends on the vole population, we have some boxes that have a pair. We have some boxes that have two males and a single female, so two males provisioning. And we have some boxes where one male provisions two boxes. Now, the boxes might be a mile apart. So um, we don't have a good handle on exactly what the hunt territory is. Uh, and I think the territory size also depends upon the rodent density uh, at the time. And so that's, that's, a, that's a great it's a great question, uh, and certainly uh, it's going to be difficult to answer in the forest up here because it's just so dense, and, and it's tough to run telemetry and things like that here. Question? How many kids were born? 
this year, um, 34 nests averaging about five, so 170 maybe this year. And, uh, and actually this is a, a pretty decent year. Um, if, you're, if you're chick number six, you have less than a 5% chance of living, period. Doesn't matter what your year is. Um, if you're chick five, you have about a 15% chance of living. If you're chick one, you have about a 90 plus percent uh, and, and it goes down. So chick three has about a 70 and that's kind of your tipping point. So I think that's, um, so most years we got, even in the bad years, we got at least one, but there were some boxes though that we lost six. And you know, you'd lose six in that 18 day range and so, you know, at day 13, they're starting to lose weight. And by day 21, you've lost them all. And it's just, it, it, it's depressing. But, um, you know, it's, uh, um, so, but most of those lived. Yes? I don't, I don't know the answer to that question because I'm not, I'm not certain, they're probably not like wrens, where a male likes to have multiple boxes so he can put multiple females in. Um, but I'm not sure what the uh, selection criterion that the female's using to actually say, that's the one. Uh, we have some couple nest boxes. We have a, a peony farm out um, uh, by two rivers, and we put up a couple nest boxes in our woods there with zero success. Uh, they know to avoid researchers. Uh, but I'm... Uh, I understand that you know, people have a couple of nest boxes in their yards here in Fairbanks, usually have one occupied. They've never ha I've never heard of anybody having two occupied. Uh, but I think having multiple boxes, you have a better chance of having the right conditions for one box to, uh, um, to be picked. Um, yeah. Well, well, that's, that's a great question. Um, we don't know what happens to them after they leave, other than it is amazing. Sometimes we get to a nest box, just you actually see the chick's head coming out. And when you take that one down to weigh him, phew, he's gone. And literally, by the time you're sitting on the ground, and they, they can't fly when they leave yet. They've got uh, about three quarters developed wings, so they can glide, if you will, and they can, they can, they're like parrots. They can use their bill and scrabble up branches and, and use their wings to get up, but they jump, and they're like giant fleas. They just go boing, 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 and by the time you can stand up, they might be 50 or 60 feet away, and I think they're doing about the same thing when they fledge. So once they're out and about, the, uh, you will see voles delivered to the nest box by the male, but I think at that point, uh, at least from the literature, females also, um, oh, and I also didn't mention after about day 16, day 17, if you can imagine having teenage owlets and you're stuck in the box, female leaves. So they're on their own from day 16 on, on their own in the nest box. Um, there's no supervision. Uh, and so she's out and about. And so I think both of them are then kind of delivering the nest box and delivering the chicks. Uh, and this is where it gets... Uh, dicey because it, with the hoot surveys, they were finding that males would hoot for 20 minutes if they could get a female and then shut up. And I think the hooting was attracting horned owls. And so if you hooted too long, you got eaten. So um, on years with the hoot surveys were really, there, there's a lot of callback. Uh, they had very poor nesting. And it's basically a bunch of single males that are risking finding a mate on years where you had almost no callback and you'd expect nothing, the nest boxes were almost all full. And, and they're thinking it's a, a, a predator aversion uh, sort of tactic. Well, if you look at it from the other perspective, if young owlets are calling around, this is where I think, uh, um, I, I have no idea what their survivorship rate is because we've never recaptured any of our individuals, but the population's pretty stable. So, uh, but if you're producing if uh, we have individuals that are banded that are close to 10 years old. So if over 10 years you've produced 30 chicks and you really keep a stable population, only need two of those to survive, uh, I can't imagine that many of the fledged individuals are living in any given year. I think in part because you know, they're calling 
martins are finding them, horned owls are finding them, or, or other predators are. But again, that's supposition on my part because we can't track them right now. Um, we don't know. They, um, they, they leave uh, a couple days apart. And oh, we have looked and we've, we've done circles around nest boxes going, it was here yesterday. I, you know, it's got to be someplace close. And we flushed a couple of females that were nearby, but we've never found, and in our circle, I just don't think has been big enough. I think they've, they've really, they've traveled, uh, which would make it a little more difficult to, to feed, but I don't know. I'm also very interested because uh, sawwood owls, a close relative, uh, they migrate all the way to the Gulf Coast now, we're finding. And so depending on what prey populations are like in the northern forests, you get fluctuating owl migration. Boreals don't do that, so we're assuming that they stay up here year-round. Now, does that mean young owls are going to the southern part of the boreal forest, or are they actually staying in Fairbanks area and having to live through the winters, you know, even the really harsh ones? Uh, it's just, it's so difficult to find telemetry that can survive 50 below zero with no sunlight to recharge batteries. So, yeah, we don't know. Um, yeah, this, yeah, we, uh, so there's, uh, there were fabulous, it was, uh, cameras used by the BBC for some of their field, uh, work, and these cameras were just incredible, um, except when the squirrels would chew on the wires, uh, but other than that, uh, they, they worked very, very well. Uh, we took a, a deep cycle battery, uh, Aaron took a deep cycle battery, and lugged them all the way out to the nest boxes. Uh, and then had every three days redo the batteries on 25 camera, 23 cameras uh, for six weeks. He was big and strong when he got done. Yeah. That picture there, how long did it take to get it? Um, oh, not long. They, no. were, they, they were at the, oh, I like these birds. Yeah, the, the part that I find very interesting, though, is you can see the quagmire that is uh, on the toes. Uh, the, uh, it, it's, it's just soupy in the nest box at that point. But They're so alert that if he's moved, then it's in there. And, they, and so what, you, to get them to stop looking at absolutely everything, they have to move really slowly. But they're, they're fast. once they're about to fledge, it's impossible. Because um, all the nests, we have family portraits of all of them as they're growing up. So we line them all up. Um, from the beginning all the way up through. It, it takes maybe three, four, five minutes to do the whole, everybody, you know, process to do them all and get them back up in the nest. Um, some days in the real hot nest box, though, um, it's actually nice. We'll let them cool down a little bit uh, before you put them back up in the hot box. Uh, but so we'd line them up. So we, um, after they reach a certain point, then it becomes annoying as, you know, you get this one situated and that one goes boing, 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 and off he goes. But, uh, yep. Yeah, and then they, they and, and oh, you put him back in the nest box, and he's touching me, and there's this this brawl that takes place, and sometimes you open a nest box up, and there's one in each corner, and you know there's nobody in the opening intervening section, but they're all sitting there. But if you put one of them back in, and he bumps against this one, then there's this brawl, and they're they're all back to their corners again. So I, I the. The inter-nest relationship uh, is going to be fabulous as we go through and look at that from a behavioral perspective um, in coming years, because we have plenty of video for it. Yeah? Oh, we're banding everybody. Once, once they hit 115 grams, we can band them. Yeah. Yeah, because there are... Uh, we have never caught one of our... We have never recaptured one of our females, typically, because we don't get males. Uh, we have never recaptured a female nesting in any nest box on the Eleatorstes um, in hundreds and hundreds of females we've banded. We have adults, and we've recaptured some adults or some that Travis and crew have banded in previous years. I think we had one from 2005 and 2012, so over seven years, the female had been bouncing back and forth between boxes. But we've never recaptured a baby. So they were banded as adults. They were banded as adults. Never, never had a recapture on any on any chick, and and it, it leads to all sorts of questions. Um, in, in talking about dispersal, maybe the parents have the adults have a home range, 
and chicks aren't allowed. Uh, you know, once you grow up, you know, there's only so much food, so, uh, or maybe chicks fly south or to coastal areas where the climate's a little bit more moderated um, for a year. I, it, I, we have no idea. Uh, we don't know. But we know we've never recaptured one. Um, we don't know because uh, we don't catch males. And so we do have the genet we do have the genetics, we do have the DNA for all of them, but we have all we did was we have the DNA still, but all we've really looked at is the sex. Um, so we can make sure our um, our weights, particularly um, at day 16 or 17, if one of the big ones eats one of the small ones and it's only a little one, we, before you hit that, that weight jump, you can't tell it. So we've, um, as soon as they hatch, we take a buckle swab so we know what they are. Can you identify the males which are um, two um, they, That's from the European literature. Uh, so, th yeah, that's, we haven't, uh, though uh, um, Ted Swim did some work on it. Uh, he's with uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And uh, he had a nest box that had a haunch of a uh, snowshoe hare. And he had another nest box that had the head of a snowshoe hare, um, uh, the head end of a, young snowshoes. Um, and, you know, he didn't have the presence of mind at the time to take a DNA sample to see if it was the same one. But there is the potential that the same sort of thing can be happening here. Uh, we, we, um, we are actually the first ones to really look at this. They've been looking at, um, at nesting frequency rates, but not what's happening in the nest. So we have a lot more questions. Yeah. Well, guys, thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Yeah.